Good morning, everyone. How are you all doing this morning? Give me a wave so I know you're alive. Fantastic. 50% of you are alive. Brilliant. Hey, for anyone I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, my name is James. I'm part of the team here, and we're just going to go for it this morning. We're going to dive into week two of our message series, The Bible, Discover the Life-Changing Power of God's Word. Why don't you take a look at these verses about the Bible with me? They will appear on the screen behind me. This is from 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. It says this, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture, all of the Bible is God-breathed. Scripture is not simply a book with good advice in it, or a history book, or a place to learn about God. Although, as we're going to see, it is all of those things. It's God-breathed. It's got the living, moving spirit of God in it. It's inspired by God. It's alive and active. When you read the Bible, you are connecting with and encountering God. And because of that, it's useful for teaching us about who God is, about who we are, about what life's all about. It's useful for rebuking us, correcting us, training us. You know, as we read the Bible, I don't know if this is your experience, but I'm challenged and I'm changed. We, I grow as a follower of Jesus. It has authority. It's not a pick and choose, take it or leave it kind of book. It's living and active and penetrating the God breathed living word of God. You know, and our heart for this series is really to say to every person here and us as a church, if we want to be people who are growing in our knowledge and love for God, if we want to be people who are encountering the living presence of God in our lives, if we want to be people who make a difference for God in our world, we have to be those who not only read, but obey the word of God. And you know, there have been so many moments for me in my life when the Bible has spoken to me and had a transforming impact upon me. I remember before I became a Christian, when I was searching for God and I'd started to read the Bible a little bit and I found myself reading this strange book in the Old Testament called Ecclesiastes. Not the sort of place you'd you'd probably direct someone who came to you and said, I'd like to find out more about God. Where, Where should I look in the Bible? But that's where I found myself, and I remembered this book captured my heart. This slightly depressing account of this ancient king who'd lived a life full of pleasure and wealth and undertaking great projects, but ultimately who found them all to be empty. And I read in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 when it says this, God has set eternity in the human heart. And for me, it was a a light bulb moment that, yeah, there was a God-shaped eternity-sized hole in my life that no amount of pleasure or wealth or fame or significance or power could ever fill only God. I remember when Sarah and I were weighing up whether to make some fairly big kind of sacrifices in our own personal lives in order to serve Jesus, whether or not to do something that was going to be financially costly and not quite how we'd seen our lives panning out and a bit hard and not all that glamorous. And I remember us sensing that God was speaking to us through Isaiah chapter 6, where the prophet Isaiah has this incredible dramatic encounter with God in all his holiness and awesomeness and splendor. And then he hears the voice of God calling to him. And it says this, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And it was like the weight and conviction of God came upon us. We'd said we we would follow him wherever he took us. We'd said we wanted to make a difference for him and, and be in ministry for him. And it was almost like God was saying, who are you now to turn around and say to me, it's not quite the tailor-made opportunity we were looking for, God. And in that moment, we knew we had to respond. We were those who God was saying, who shall I send? And who will go for us? And we said, here am I, send me. And I could go on and on about the times when God has spoken to me in a living and active way through his word. But over and above specific verses and specific moments, the daily habit of spending time in God's word, of studying it, 
of reading it, of obeying it, of, of listening to others who have taught it to me, of trying to live it out. It's transformed my life in so many ways. It's not all the mountaintop, big dramatic ways. Most days that doesn't happen. You know, it's not every meal you eat is like a Michelin starred delight, is it? Sometimes you just eat to sustain you and keep you going and you trust that it's nourishing you and forming you and shaping you. It's like that with the Bible. Most days it's like eating breakfast. It's not this mountaintop spiritual high. But over time it strengthens, it nourishes, it encourages, it challenges, it changes me and leads me into the goodness and blessing and life of God. If you want to know God more deeply, if you want to follow him more wholeheartedly, if you want to have a greater impact for him, you must be someone who reads and studies and obeys the Bible. But let's be honest for just a moment. The Bible is also a pretty hard book to read, isn't it? It's this big, complex, long book that can be hard to navigate. It's thousands of pages long. It's made up of these 66 smaller books. It uses names and words and ideas that we don't understand. We're not all people who are naturally great readers. We would never find ourselves reading a book anywhere near as complicated as this in any other moment in our lives. And so we can find ourselves, you know, in, in the middle of the book of Leviticus, reading several chapters about how exactly to remove the fat from the entrails of a lamb in preparation for sacrifice. And we can think, what am I meant to get out of this? Is this the living and active word of God for me? What on earth is going on here? And one of the reasons I believe, one of the reasons, not the whole reason, but one of the reasons we find the Bible hard to understand is because we don't understand the big story. We don't understand how it all holds together and how the different books and moments and the history all weaves together. And so what I want to try and do this morning is just try and give us a sense of the big story of the Bible, how it all fits together. And to help me, I've got this board behind me, which I'm going to be writing on and drawing on as we go. Now, this morning is a bit of a risk, okay, for a few reasons. Firstly, because my... Writing and artistic abilities are extremely limited. My handwriting alone is terrible. Literally anything that even needs to look remotely presentable, I normally get the fabulous Tom Norrington to help me with in church life. But I'm up here all alone today, guys. Secondly, it's a risk because, you know, I don't want to go in for too many gender stereotypes, but I cannot multitask. So every time I turn around to write on this board... It was going to be an awkward silence, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do this free-flowing thing, right? So you're going to have to bear with me. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, it's a risk because you could leave this morning being more confused about the storyline of the Bible than when you came in. But let's hope that doesn't happen. So everybody be kind to me this morning, okay? Turn to the person next to you and say, be, be kind to James today, okay? Be kind to James. So, here we go. Here we go. The story of the Bible begins with creation. Hey, is it coming up on the screen? Amazing. Begins with creation. God God creates the universe. The stars. Look at that. Brilliant. The planets. Look at that. He creates the earth. This is where it really falls apart, right? Okay. That's That's the earth. And he creates human beings. Here we go. Talking about gender stereotypes. Look, we know in 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 Genesis they were actually naked, so be thankful I've done it like this, okay? And he creates human beings as the pinnacle of his creation. And we can read all about this in Genesis 1 and 2, chapters 1 and 2, right at the beginning of the Bible. And it doesn't really matter if we, you know, read those verses in the Bible as as kind of a really literal account of exactly what happened or we're reading them in a more metaphorical way. The point is God created a beautiful, awe-inspiring universe and world. He made it good. And he created us in the image of God, precious, valuable, special, to be in relationship 
with him as our king. That's how it was meant to work. Trusting him, walking with him in a world without fear or shame or evil or darkness or sickness or death. But then came the fall. The fall, which we read about in Genesis chapter 3. Instead of choosing to live God's way, men and women, instead of living with him as our king, instead of that deep connection with God, we turned away from him. We decided to reject God as the one who decides what is right and wrong, the one who we submit to, the one who we live with as our king. And it's like we decided... Sorry, there are little crowns there if you can't see them. We wanted to be king instead. We didn't want to submit to God. We didn't want to obey God. We didn't want to do things his way. We wanted to be king ourselves. And then it's like the rest of the next few chapters of Genesis are an outworking of that decision. Now life is hard. Now death enters the world. Now brokenness enters the world. This relationship with God, which gave us joy and life and freedom and hope, is taken away. And the early chapters of Genesis, or Sarah told me to do this, to symbolize death coming into the world. The cross is on the eyes. I think that's a little bit grim, or you can't see that, can you? But anyway, death came into the picture. And the rest of the next few chapters of Genesis, I kind of like the outworking of that. You remember moments like when Cain kills his brother Abel. You remember moments like when God decides to start again with one family because the whole earth is full of wickedness with Noah and his ark. And as we read on, next comes the story into this picture of Israel. Oh, I spelt that wrong earlier. There we go, that's right. Israel, I spelt it earlier. Israel. And actually, in a way, that's the entire story of the rest of the Old Testament. If you like, this is the Old Testament. Many of you will know the Bible is split into these two halves. The Old Testament bit is kind of the bit before the coming of Jesus and his life, death and resurrection. And then what happens next? The Old Testament is a bit before that. And the story of Israel begins with God calling a couple called Abraham and Sarah. I do apologize for my handwriting. This is as good as it gets, guys. Abraham and Sarah. And he makes this promise to them. He says to this couple, I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to make you into a great nation. But not just for you. Not just only for yourselves. But so that in turn, every nation on earth will be blessed through you. And then after Abraham and Sarah, we, we get Isaac. And then we get Jacob. And then we get Joseph. Following through the rest of the story of the book of Genesis, chapters 12 to 50. And God begins to fulfill this promise. This people go from one couple into a mighty nation, into this big extended family who become known as Israel. But through this sequence of events, they end up in Egypt. Let's draw a couple of pyramids. We might as well, eh? They end up in the land of Egypt. By this time, they're a great nation, probably millions of people. But they end up getting enslaved in Egypt. And this is when we get the Exodus. Let's write this here, Exodus. You guys still with me? Yeah, I need a bit of audience interaction here. Otherwise, I'm going to feel very lonely. Exodus. And we get Moses. We get Moses. Moses is called to lead his people out of slavery in Egypt. And then through this long journey of 40 years in the wilderness. During which time God gives his people his law. So we've got the stone tablets with the... The law on the Ten Commandments and all the other laws that God gives his people. You get the the temple, which at this stage in the story is just a a tent because they're, they're wandering in the wilderness. The temple, the place where the people can connect with God. He gives the people the sacrificial system. This is a sheep. The sacrificial system. 
It's not good when the artist has to tell you what he's drawing, is it? (laughs) And he gives them the priesthood. Let's draw a priest, big beard. (laughs) I'm not sure if they probably were happier than that, but I've drawn him as unhappy. (laughs) Quite serious. God gives the people this huge complex system of the temple and sacrifices and laws and priests. And it's all a way to make a way for sinful, fallen, broken people, disconnected with God because of the fall, to draw near to God. And even as you're reading it and reading the story of the Bible, there's a sense in which this this doesn't really work, does it? In God's grace, it's a way to have his presence in a really limited way at the heart of the community, in the middle of the temple. But it doesn't really work. There must be something better than this. This isn't a restoration of this, that's for sure. And then after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, of getting the law and the priesthood and the sacrificial system, you finally get them entering in to the promised land. Let me draw this. Promised land. Promised land. Into the land of Israel. So let's st- stop for a moment now and talk about some of the books of the Bible. I'm just going to move myself over here, guys. That's going to be easier. You can see the board. It's pretty slick, this, isn't it? Come on, guys. Right. Okay, let's talk about this. Books of the Bible. Well, we've already spoken about this is all. We're going to move more quickly through the rest of them. Don't worry. This is all in Genesis. Not Phil Collins and all that. The biblical book of Genesis. Right. Okay, then next up, we read about, I'm going to stick these on because writing them will take too long. We read about the law and this journey in the wilderness and how God calls Moses and he gives them the sacrificial system and all that stuff. We read about that in these books, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. And then you get this whole series of books which essentially recount the history of God's people, the Israelites, as they enter into and then settle into the promised land. So let me stick these up now. These are the books of Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. And actually, 1 and 2 Chronicles kind of tells the same part of the story as certainly 2 Samuel through the end of 2 Kings and a bit of 1 Samuel. So sometimes that used to confuse me. I kind of was reading the same things from a different perspective. But that's how the books of 1 and 2 Chronicles work. And loads of amazing stories and parts of the Bible and the great characters and moments in those kind of Old Testament stories are found in those books. And you see kind of the story of Israel in the promised land kind of reaches its its pinnacle with King David. And then through one and two kings, you get the story of all the kings who followed after David, starting with his son, Solomon. And then following on from Solomon, who builds this temple properly in Jerusalem, in the promised land. Then he's followed by loads of other kings, loads of other rulers over Israel. But you know, this whole story of Israel is also time of massive failure. Massive failure. Sorry, that failure is terrible. Um, Massive failure and decline. Time and time again, God's people turn away from him. Time and time again, they fail to live up to this calling, the calling on Abraham and Sarah. I'm going to bless you. Yes, I'm going to choose you as my people. Yes, you're going to be specially blessed by you and known as my people, and I'm going to presence myself with you. But it's in order that you might be a blessing to others. The kings are corrupt and act unjustly. Even David, the great King David, who the people had hoped, maybe this is the promised Messiah. Maybe this is the one who fulfills all the hopes and promises of restoration, of creation, Even he ends up being a failure. He ends up sleeping with another man's wife and having him killed. And and through this long story of failure, eventually the kingdom of Israel ends up splitting in two. You get this split. And one of the kingdoms, the northern kingdom, is called Israel. And the southern kingdom is called Judah. They end up splitting. And eventually both of these Uh, countries, both of these new nations of Israel and Judah 
they end up getting conquered by other empires. Many people are killed and many others are taken off into exile. The Babylonians, the Assyrians, they capture the people, they take them back to their lands. And later on, some of the Israelites are allowed to return to the promised land. And you read about those moments, going to stick something else up. No, you you read about those moments in the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. As some people return to the promised land and, 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 and the kind of the account of the people of God in exile and what happens then. And so, if you like, from Genesis through to Esther, that's the kind of chronological story of the Old Testament. And this used to really confuse me because there are loads of other books in the Old Testament. But I think the headline would be those books fit into parts of this historical narrative from Genesis through to Ezra. Because sitting alongside all of this, you have books in the Bible like these. Let me stick this one up. You have books in the Bible like these. Job. Books like Job, which is all about the question of suffering, as told through the life of this guy called Job. The book of Psalms, which many of us will know, a great place full of songs and poems of worship and prayer to God. You get places like the book of Proverbs, full of great practical wisdom for how to live your life. Books like Ecclesiastes, the one that spoke to me all those years ago. Books like the Song of Songs, or sometimes called the Song of Solomon. Basically a book about love and romance and sex. Check it out in your own time. You've got books like the Book of Lamentations. A lament about the state of the promised land and its people after they've been conquered and exiled. And then you've got all the prophetic books, which have... Strange names because they're named after the prophets who, who wrote them or whose ministry they recount. You get all these prophets, people who lived in large part during the time of sort of failure and demise or the time of exile for the people of God. Sometimes they were speaking God's judgment over the people and saying, if you do not turn back, this is what will happen. But sometimes you get these beautiful moments. Sarah read some words from Isaiah this morning, a book which a lot of it is these pronouncements of judgment on the people of God, but these signs of hope, signposting a day when God would restore something, but actually much bigger than about this one nation and these kings and these people. A Messiah, a coming saviour, there's something bigger being signposted in the prophetic books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, or the Americans seem to say Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. And that's the Old Testament. That's the Old Testament story. I think all the books of the Old Testament are on there somewhere. And then you get silence for 400 years. Silence for 400 years after the last prophetic voice, Malachi. Not all of those prophetic books are necessarily in sort of chronological order, but Malachi is the sort of last prophet in the timeline. Malachi's ministry in about 400 BC. And then you get 400 years of silence. And it's pretty bleak. It's like everything has failed. God had made a good world. Man had rejected God. Man was cut off from the goodness and life of God and and the world began to go wrong. But then God, this sign of a promise, he called this couple. He said, I'm going to bless you and all nations of the earth are going to be blessed for you. This hint of a salvation plan of a new chapter for for the world had begun and it, it moved through Exodus and Moses and the law and the temples and the priesthood and into the promised land. But it had all gone wrong. The people had continually turned away from God to the point where they were in exile and then just silence. Before we move into the New Testament, I hope you can see how one really important thing to understand when you're reading the Bible is a little bit about what book you're reading. You know, if I am reading the book of Leviticus, which is essentially a book about the ceremonial laws that the priests and the people of Israel had to observe when they were in the wilderness for 40 years, 
I'm not necessarily going to sort of connect with God at a heart level in every verse in the book of Leviticus, in the way that I might in the Psalms or certainly in some of the New Testament books we're going to look at in a moment. That doesn't mean Leviticus isn't the God-breathed, inspired word of God because it's part of this big story and there are wonderful themes and truths we can draw from that book that tell us about who God is. But it's okay if, 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 if essentially a legal document or a document about ceremonial laws or a historical list of all the different kings, we don't connect at a heart level in the same way as we do in another place in the Bible. That doesn't make it any less God's word. And it's really helpful. You can ask someone for help or you can find the information on the Bible. You know, just to know a little bit about what I'm reading, what book this is, where it fits in God's story. But now let's, let's move into the New Testament. And we're going to do this quickly because we'll be focusing much more on Jesus and the New Testament story in the weeks to come. The New Testament. You get Jesus. Jesus comes after this 400 years of silence. You get Jesus. And many of you will know, just grab a bit of sellotape, the place where we read about the life, and most importantly, the death and resurrection of Jesus is in the gospel accounts. Again, named after the people who wrote them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And yeah, these, these tell us about the, the death of Jesus and the... Will this work? That's pretty good, isn't it? The resurrection of Jesus. And it's like it's all been building to this point. And I'm just conscious of time, and we're going to look at this in a lot more detail in the weeks to come. But all of this, all of this is about Jesus. It's all pointing forward to Jesus. It's all creating a hunger and a sense of desire and, and prophesying and looking forward and creating this, this gap that Jesus comes into. God's plan to restore everything that was lost in the fall to defeat sin and death and brokenness, to make a way for humanity to be in relationship with him again, is about Jesus. Through his death and his resurrection, Jesus has defeated death once and for all and made a way for me and you to walk in relationship with God. It's like Noah's Ark points forward to Jesus, the one in whom we can truly be rescued. The law really points forward to Jesus. It shows us we we can never measure up to these standards, but we don't have to because in Jesus we have one who does. The temple points forward to Jesus. The place where God and man can come together and meet is in the person and ministry of Jesus. The sacrifices really point forward to Jesus. The only one who could ever really pay the price for humanity's sins. Not, not a lamb or a goat or some grain offerings. It's Jesus. The priesthood really points forward to Jesus. The one who truly mediates between God and man. The great heroes and kings and uh, people of the Bible, they're just signposts to Jesus. The prophecies. So many of these prophecies and these words you find in these books are fulfilled in Jesus. And then after Jesus, you get the church. You get the church, the people of God who've responded to Jesus and his mission and calling. You get the book of Acts, which is actually written by the same guy as Luke. And he's kind of like part two of his story, what happens after the resurrection of Jesus. It tells a story of how this message of Jesus is taken out to the ends of the world. The kingdom of God is proclaimed. The resurrection of Jesus is proclaimed. Churches are established in the early days of the church. And we read about people like Peter and the apostle Paul, someone who is far from God, as you could imagine, who comes to know Jesus and becomes a pioneer in this, in this time. And again, I'm not going to write them because it'll take too long, but you read it. Basically, the rest of the New Testament is, is letters written to these early churches or to individuals in the early churches. And some of them have funny names, and often that's because this is the place they were written to. So Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, written to the church in Corinth. 
Galatians in Galatia, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 and 2 Peter, 1, 2 and 3 John, and Jude. And then the Bible finishes by looking to the future. And this is, it's a little bit of an oversimplification to say Revelation is all about the future because some of it's not really, but part of it, and certainly at the end, it looks forward to the future. Looking forward to the day when Jesus is going to return, when every knee will bow and every tongue confess, and this relationship will be restored and this world <laughs> will be made new and restored. Guys, we did it. We did it. If, if someone comes and tells me that there's one book of the Bible that's missing, I'm going to cry, okay? I think they're all on there. Listen, I'm going to get off the stage in a moment. It's a little bit different this morning. Uh, maybe, maybe a couple of the guys could ca- come and help me lift this down. That would be great. Take these brakes off. Let's pop that to the side somewhere. Thanks, guys. You got it. That's awesome. We're going to worship Jesus together in just a moment. But if I can just say two things in closing, it would be this. Firstly, the Bible is all about Jesus. And I really want you to come back next week as we focus on exactly how that works. The Bible is all about Jesus. But secondly, in many ways, the story of the Bible is our story. You know, the Bible isn't all about us in the sense that we should read every verse as being directly applicable to my life. No, in so many ways, it's pointing to Jesus. It's about Jesus. But actually, in a kind of big picture, the story of the Bible is our story, is my story, is your story. We've been created by God. We're made in his image. You are the pinnacle of God's creation. Something of his divine life and love and hope and truth is in you. You're not just a random selection of atoms in a meaningless universe. You were created for relationship and connection and communion with God. But you've fallen. You've fallen short. We've all sinned. We've all failed. There is now separation between you and God. Brokenness and sin and death have entered our world and our lives. And a bit like the story of Israel, which is long and convoluted and ancient history and all that stuff. In many ways, there's so much similarity because so much of our lives and the things we put in place, whether we know it or not, are ultimately about us trying to find our way back to God trying to find meaning and purpose. And we don't look to priests and kings and temples, but we can look to relationships or money or travel or popularity or family or drink or drugs. Some good things, some not so good things, but all trying to find meaning, all trying to fill that hole that's been left since creation and the fall, that longing for meaning and purpose and hope in life. And then into that story comes Jesus who comes and offers us life in all its fullness, who comes and makes a way for what was broken in Eden at the fall to be restored, to give us hope and an eternal future. He is the answer we've been searching for all our lives. And he died on a cross and was resurrected, reversing the impact of the fall and overcoming the separation between God and man. And through him, we get caught up in this mission, in his church, in his people to change the world. And through him, we have a glorious future ahead of us. You know, if you're here today and you're someone who's not a Christian, your life, your longings, your failures, your hopes and fears are all pointing you to Jesus. He knows you. He loves you. He has a better story for you. Why not reach out to him today? Come and find me or chat to the person who brought you or come and find our ministry team at the end of the meeting. We'd love to pray for you. And if you are a Christian here today, don't we have an amazing story? Don't we have an amazing God? Don't we have an amazing hope? 
We're going to worship him together now. Can I ask that we stand? and Maybe the band can come back up. I'll just shift these bits of paper for you guys. Let's stand together. Why don't we just close our eyes and hold open our hands as we did at the start of our time. I'm going to pray. We're going to worship God. God, thank you for this amazing story. Thank you, God, that we are made in your image. That every single person in this room, no matter what sense of failure or shame or guilt or what kind of life they've lived, is beloved by you and created by you for relationship with you. And that through Jesus, you have made a way to overcome any barrier, any obstacle, any sin, any brokenness that's in our lives. That through Jesus, we can step into relationship with you. We can know your love, your power, your presence. We can have all our shame and guilt taken away. We can have the hope of eternal life in you. So right now, right across this room, we just... We just step towards you, Jesus. We say yes to you. We say yes to this story and our part in it. Whether we're taking that step as a a reconfirmation of our faith and life in you, or whether we're taking that step for the very first time, we acknowledge you as our only hope. The only hope for our world, the only hope for our future. We say it's all about you, Jesus. Fill us with your Holy Spirit now, as you did with that church in Acts, Lord. Thank you that the Holy Spirit is not just available to the anointed few, to the Davids and the Moses and the prophets, but it's available to us. Come and fill us with your Holy Spirit. Enable us and equip us to worship you and live for you and glorify you now and on into Monday and Tuesday and through the rest of the week, Lord. Thank you for this story, the only story that matters, the only story that has any hope for our world. We love you, God. We worship you. Let's worship together, guys. Let's worship Jesus.